Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Now, as y'all know, uh, I am your host, John, but I am joined this week by two co-hosts. So go ahead and introduce yourselves, ladies. Hello. Um, I am Tess. I was like, Daisy's definitely going to speak first. Uh, <laughs> I'm Tess. Uh, I'm a raptor keeper from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, one of the hosts of Train Talks and Tales. And this is Daisy. Hi, everyone. Tess and I are so excited to join John today on your weekly Z News. So like Tess said, my name is Daisy. I am a marine animal specialist on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. Yeah, and I'm so excited to have you both here as part of our wonderful week of collaboration. Uh, everyone go and make sure that you are subscribed not only to the Raw Safari podcast, but to Trainer Talks and Tales. And uh, so it's a wonderful podcast. It, you'll get to hear a whole lot of training talk, a whole lot of cool animal stuff, and these wonderful accents. So uh, it's, it's a pretty good <laughs> listen all the way around. Um, and so I, I like to start off each episode by just some random conversational stuff about my life. Life. And so I have, I have two things that we're going to briefly discuss before we get into the news segment. First of all, I have a question for you two. Uh, uh -oh. Do y'all name your phones? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, that, okay. Sh should we? Thing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I know a lot of people that name their phones, which I think is, I've always thought is weird. I've always, that's, I've been like, that's strange, right? That's not a that's thing. That's strange. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm with you on that. However... I just recently got a new iPhone and I decided that I was sick of it just showing up as either John's iPhone or like iPhone random number when people, um, you know, would, would like airdrop stuff to me or whatever. And so I decided to name my phone this time around and uh, I'm very proud of it. And this is podcast related. So it's worth mentioning. My phone is now called Rossifoni, R-O-S-S-I-F-O-N-I. Come on, right? Okay, not bad, not bad. <laughs> I'm way too proud of that one. So I for sure thought that you were talking about like when you say to someone like I'm going to go pick up my phone, you're saying I'm going to go pick up, you know, Sandy. <laughs> if that's yeah, what you mean. Me too. I didn't realise you meant you'd like actually, you mean the naming, Name which the I device, have named yes. my phone, but it is just Daisy's iPhone Fair. with a little yeah. whale emoji. That's it, as, it as makes... basic as it gets. A bit more sense now that you mean for like airdrop and that kind of stuff, not just being like, yeah, oh, Sandy's ringing. Hang on. Give me one sec. Like Fair. <laughs> Although to be honest, I have multiple times since I made this decision been like, Zoe, I need to go grab Rossifoni or like, oh, I, I left Rossifoni in the other room. So it, it's kind of become that now, but that's just my okay. own general <clears throat> weirdness. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit embarrassed for you. <laughs> Yeah, it's giving me um, dad joke vibes. I mean, I'm a dad. Yeah. It's allowed. I've always said that I only had Miles so that I could make dad jokes like for real because I, I've always made them. But now I have an excuse. Uh, True. So, yeah. So and then um, I guess the other thing I was wondering about, since y'all are a whole like world away, is Halloween and trick or treating a thing in Australia? It's so sad. No, I feel like it's really not. We actually even, we had a text, you know, chat with our friends yesterday and Tess was saying, how have we not done a Halloween party? But I reckon we have sent that same text for the last five years. <laughs> <laughs> and this might be a little bit embarrassing to some people, but Tess will appreciate, but I have maybe five or six Christmas decorations already up. <laughs> Whoa. So I've, I've gone way past Halloween. We are in Christmas mode. Christmas movies were on already. Um, yeah. Amazing. I, I wish it was. I'm sure I was going to say, I'm surprised by that with, with you Tess, because I know you like dressing up in costumes. Well, um, because it's not such a big thing here in Australia, I'm a bit cursed 
whenever I put out fake cobwebs and like a pumpkin from work with a candle in it and I have my lollies, we don't call them candy, um, at the door, uh, no kids come. And then another night, like the next Halloween, I'll be like, oh, no one ever comes. I'll have trick or treaters, and I'll be like, "Oh, for God's sake, here's a muesli bar. I didn't buy any lollies. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's not a really a big thing, um, unless you make it really obvious with decorations out the front. And it depends on the suburb, but yeah, I wish we did it like the US. That's amazing. Yeah. It is really fun. And the interesting thing where I grew up, and now where Miles lives uh, in the the central Pennsylvania area, is that um. Trick or treat is not done on Halloween. I don't know why. Most of the country just does it the night of Halloween, but but they always do it like the Thursday before Halloween. And so we're recording this for for me. It, it's now Wednesday. I guess it's Wednesday, you guys too. But it's like you guys are ahead of us. Yeah. So it's Wednesday as we're recording this. My Wednesday is just starting. Um. So tomorrow night I am going trick or treating with my son Miles. And uh, I, I figured you all would want to know what my costume is. And I, again, I don't even know if this is a cultural thing in Australia, but I'm going as Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip. Do you guys know that at all? Nope. Oh, the faces. Oh, y'all. <laughs> y'all. Oh, the name rings a bell. Okay. Mm. Okay. So there is mm. this amazing comic strip that that uh, has long since been over, but, but is still very popular in the United States called Calvin and Hobbes about a mm. little boy, a little blonde boy who wears a uh, red and black striped shirt um, who has a friend. His best friend is his stuffed tiger named Hobbs. Yes. And Hobbs yeah. comes to life for Calvin, but is just a stuffed animal whenever anyone else is in the room. Yeah. Um, it is a beautiful thing. And I'm going as Calvin. I, I Yep, that is Calvin and Hobbs. Uh-huh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I had to Google it. Yes, I'm going as Calvin and... My stuffed red panda, Red, who has been featured on the podcast many times, has a tiger costume and is going as Hobbs. So we're, we're very excited about that. That's so That cute. is adorable. <laughs> I want to see your adorable little Halloween costume. Oh, there will definitely be pictures. But even though we don't celebrate Halloween anywhere near as much as you guys do, Tess and I did say about trying to collaborate um, all the best like Halloween enrichment photos we can find at different zoos and aquariums and we'll do a little social post on them. So if any of your listeners have got really cool Halloween enrichment, we want to see it. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, it is a big thing here to um, even just give animals pumpkins and see what they do yeah. with them. It is really fascinating. Um, I can tell you, I don't I don't know if it's out there yet or if they will post it soon. But the Toronto Zoo uh, Red Pandas got some really fun pumpkin enrichment. And, and I know there are some cute photos of it. So, yeah, That's keep like an eye them. out. Absolutely. I'm excited to see them. All right. So, um, yeah, for everyone listening, uh, Rasafari Zoo News is a crowdsourced zoo news program. So don't forget that if you see anything um, that you think would be worth having on the podcast, you can send it to me at rasafaripod at gmail.com or tag me in it on socials at rasafari or at rasafaripod on the TikTok machine. And with all that said, it is time to move on to... Yeah, we are excited. We are going to start with some noteworthy births this week. The National Zoo, as they call it in America, it's the Smithsonian Zoo to us here in Australia, have announced the hatching of seven orchid oriole chicks in their birdhouse, which is super exciting. These are the very first of their species to hatch in human care, which is incredible. The zoo has also announced the hatching of three Baltimore oriole chicks for a total of 10 new orioles. That's right. And the Nashville Zoo has announced the birth of three Sumatran tiger cubs, or tiglets, as I like to call them. Now, these are the first Sumatran tigers born at the Nashville Zoo. Uh, They were born to their mother, Anne, and I, for one, credit the awesomeness of the uh, tiger exhibit that opened just a few years ago at the Nashville Zoo um, for making the animals so comfortable that, you know, it makes breeding a little bit easier and stuff. So very, very excited for the team at Nashville. 
Now, the Oakland Zoo has welcomed a new baby giraffe to their herd named Kendi. Now, Kendi means loved one in Swahili. So, congratulations to the team on this new calf um, or giraffelet, as John would probably say. As only John would probably say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. I Googled it. That's not a thing. No, it's not a thing. So, <laughs> I know that y'all are newer to the Rasafari ecosystem of podcasts, but on Zoo News, uh, over a year ago, a zoo announced baby binturongs and they called them bintlets. And that was just not a thing. I Googled it just like you did. I, I Googled it and it was not a thing. But I decided to run with it. And I've been doing this on the podcast for over a year now. All babies are just lits. Um, and um, I've also been really pushing the bintlet thing. And now <laughs> multiple other zoos have started using bintlet. And really? I know they're all zoos where I have fans. And I'm like, I can't say that I'm doing this, but but maybe. Maybe. I'm obsessed with that. What about penglets and Pen sealets? It's so oh, good. So it, it works for everything. It makes me so happy. Well, owlets is already thing. Yes, yes, it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> But all right, so um, and moving on uh, from from the births, uh, we'll we'll go to some recent deaths, uh, starting with uh, what I think is a pretty incredible story. Um, New England Aquarium is mourning the loss of Deco, an African penguin. Until she passed away, Deco was the oldest African penguin in the AZA or AZA, as y'all would say. Um, the typical lifespan of an African penguin is ten to fifteen years, but Deco was just one and a half months away from her 42nd birthday at the time of her passing. That is absolutely incredible. So uh, condolences to the team at New England Aquarium, but also like huge props for a job very, very well done. That is an incredible lifespan. For our little blue penguins in Australia, they generally live between about seven to eight out in the world and currently the oldest one in a zoological facility is at Adelaide Zoo and that penguin just turned 22. Wow. Which I think is amazing. That's yeah. so cool. So impressive. So impressive. Anyway, moving on, uh, Zoo Montana has unfortunately announced the death of Bruno the grizzly bear at the age of 23. Bruno was a beloved bear known for his droopy lip, teddy bear-like ears and a huge size. Bruno has awed fans and staff alike at Zoo Montana for 15 years after starting life as an illegally kept backyard pet. In the 15 years they've cared for him, the team at Zoo Montana constantly battled health issues facing Bruno because of, unfortunately, the neglect he faced in his youth. And it was those issues that ended up compounding to the need to euthanize him. We are all incredibly proud of the team at Zoo Montana for giving that bear a second chance of life and a pretty incredible life for that. Yeah, absolutely. I love that they mentioned that he had a droopy lip. I love that that was one of his um, <laughs> noting features. <laughs> Bless. Uh, now, the Chattanooga Zoo has announced uh, the unexpected passing of Renette, one of the chimpanzees that lived at the zoo. At the time of this recording, the zoo is not sure what happened to Renette. Uh, she started showing signs of abdominal discomfort and leg weakness one day and the team quickly worked to set up an appointment for her to get a CT and an MRI the next morning, but unfortunately she passed overnight. A necropsy has been performed, but results can take up to eight weeks to gather. Uh, it must be so hard for the keepers to not know what happened, but I hope they find peace for now and that the eventual results help them move past this sad loss. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John Tess, let's move on to some other zoo news. And this is pretty exciting. The Kansas City Zoo and Aquarium have recently welcomed two elephants from Hogel Zoo in Salt Lake City in Utah. They are joining a herd of seven elephants, including a bull and six females. Now, this represents, though, the end of an era at Hogel, as the elephants will no longer be displayed there. And this also represents a fairly continuing trend that we're seeing in zoos in the U.S., Facilities seem to either be doubling down on elephants, expanding habitats and herd sizes, just like we've seen in San Diego, the San Diego Zoo, Safari Park, Cincinnati and Fort Worth. However, there are some that are obviously being seen to stepping away from elephants entirely. And we've now seen that with Buffalo, Toronto, San Francisco and now Hogel. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. Um, at the AZA conference last year, and again this year, uh, Dan Ash, the president of the AZA, and others doubled down on their commitment to keeping elephants in the AZA. Um, I think this might actually be the best way to do it. I'm curious what y'all think, but uh, having larger herds in modernized habitats where they are more able to thrive seems seems good to me. Um, from the comments at those conferences, I never got the vibe that the plan was to consolidate to fewer zoos, but that is definitely what is happening, and it makes sense to me. Do y'all have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, elephants are a species that absolutely need really, really good habitats to be able to replicate the amount of walking they would be doing in the wild to ensure they're living out their lifespans in human care too. So, And obviously they're found in herds of a lot. They're not animals that are generally found in one or two. So, yeah, I, I think this is a good step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. I was going to say, and, and, and Tess is nodding. So that doesn't really help on a podcast, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> no, I need, a, I need a pipe up with my, I agree, not just nod. <laughs> now, um, the next thing is we're going to give huge props to the Calgary Zoo, uh, who recently announced that two zoo-born hooping cranes. Close. Whooping uh, cranes. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, Tess. Y'all, we practiced this beforehand. <laughs> Whooping. Wow. Come on. I even it's work right with birds. In, you are right in Australia, though. In yeah, Australian okay. language, you're correct. And you said that it's called the hooping cough in Australia, too, right? Look, I'm probably lying about that, too. Like, <laughs> Oh, no. Come on. You guys say everything wrong. This makes sense. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right, Tess. Yeah. I definitely say hooping cough. Yeah, me too. I'm probably going to be added on that. But anyway, hooping. Whooping. Wow. Okay. Let's start <laughs> that again. <laughs> All right. Huge props to the Calgary Zoo, who recently announced that two zoo-born whooping crane chicks have been released into the wetlands of Wisconsin. <laughs> Uh, the release was done in conjunction with the International Crane Foundation uh, with an estimated 650 whooping cranes left in the wild. This is a huge win for the Calgary Zoo. Stop sniggering, please, Daisy. <laughs> Thank you. You got it right the first time and maybe not the second time. Close Did enough. I do it wrong again? No, you're good. You're good. You're oh. good. <laughs> Sorry. Why? Daisy, maybe. get us out of this story, please. Okay, moving on. <laughs> now, the AZA Wildlife Conservation Committee has announced a new SAFE program, and that stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. It is the 34th such program. And this one is for Mexican wolves, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is actually a massive deal for the species because they are near the brink. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm super excited to see what the future holds for the program and for the wolves too. Yes, absolutely. I, I love wolves and we have so many issues with people misunderstanding them here in the States and in Mexico. And it's just it's really problematic. Um, yeah. So that is that is very exciting uh, to see. I love these new safe programs. They're really cool. Absolutely. All right. So moving on the Honolulu Zoo. Shouldn't they just call it Honolulu Zoo or Honazulu. I like Honazulu. Come on, right? I like Honazulu. That's cool. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Honolulu Zoo uh, recently announced that Anaya, their six-year-old female Sumatran tiger, was anesthetized to undergo novel artificial insemination. A team from Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska, went to the zoo to do the surgery with cryopreserved sperm from another tiger in the AZA collection. The surgery was laparoscopic oviductal AI, which has only been performed in a handful of tigers so far. Uh, this newer surgery requires only 1% of the amount of sperm cells required for traditional artificial insemination. Yeah, so cool. And this procedure has actually been fairly successful in other species, but has had a success rate of about just under 20% in tigers. However, saying that, every time a successful surgery takes place, more is learned. The procedure is refined, the team in charge gets a better understanding of the next steps needed to make this more successful to grow the population. 
I guess it's pretty impossible to know at this time to know if a pregnancy has occurred, but Anya is doing well post-op from what we've heard and fingers crossed for a viable pregnancy. Absolutely. And uh, our good friends at the Jacksonville Zoo uh, have announced the beginning of construction on their newest exhibit. And I, for one, am really excited about it. Um, The zoo will be opening a new Manatee River habitat. The habitat in question will allow the zoo to triple the amount of injured, sick or orphaned manatees they are able to take care of from six patients at a time all the way up to 18 patients because I can do math. Uh, This exhibit will also give guests an incredible look at the rescue animals in question, as well as the amazing work being done there. I can't wait to uh, get back to Jacksonville to see this exhibit once it's open. That sounds so cool. I mean, there's a lot of big draw cards for me to come to US, but a manatee river like exhibit that that's a big one. That would be so cool to see. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you guys need to come visit. Yes, oh, mate, we know. <laughs> we know. We do now, the uh, podcast on tour in Australia and then we'll go to the US. Absolutely, please. <laughs> um, I just called you mate, so I'm just bringing it back to Australia. Um, Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, which is where I work, has just opened up their very first nocturnal experience. So it's been in the making for a few years. Um, but the old spicy cough, you know, um, made the process a little bit slower but it's open now and uh, you can come visit Lone Pine at night time and see all these amazing animals uh tree kangaroos which I know you're obsessed with um wombats tassie devils all these little small macropods it's really cool so that's opened in Australia and another reason for John to come to Queensland absolutely to hang out with you two queens but um beyond that i have a couple questions um mm-hmm. so so first of all you guys call covid the spicy cough i saw you smirking at me i am obsessed with y'all that is so good that is so good the spicy uh, cough what do you call it you don't call it that covid <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I mean, in Australia, everything gets free. Yeah, I'm aware. I just didn't everything. know it was the spicy <laughs> cough. That. that that might be my favorite thing I've <laughs> I've learned doing Zoo News this week. That's amazing. Well, COVID, you know, it can be a bit triggering. So we'll just keep it at the, the spicy cough. We all know what we're talking about, but we'll just leave yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> really good. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, Voldemort. <laughs> We don't say Voldemort. <laughs> mm. Similar to that. I like it, yes. <laughs> yeah. The disease that shall not be named. Um, but so, uh, and then you said it, it's a nocturnal house, but did, did I hear you say that you can visit at night or or do you guys switch the their like natural schedule? Well, it's not actually a house. It's like all these exhibits at the back of the sanctuary um, and you can visit it during the day. Like it's free of charge to visit it um, with your admission uh, it's just that those animals are nocturnal uh, and probably going to be fast asleep in their burrows or not doing much. So if you want to see them scurrying around, you want to see them having a time, um, you'll have to come back at night. It's just, you and, can go at night. Yeah, that's so, so cool. cool. Like zoos are not open mm-hmm. at night here. That's, that's, I know that you're like a sanctuary and stuff, but like, ah! Yeah, it's awesome. And they give you um, infrared. I just made up that term no that's a real thing uh infrared cameras you can see the um the heat of the animal and you can see where they are in the exhibit if they're not scurrying and tooting around um they have like uh flashlights that are better for their eyes and that kind of stuff yeah it's really cool i did it as like a staff member last week and i was like this is awesome so that is amazing yeah one of my favorite things Mm. in the world is anytime that a zoo here is open late for any reason I try to get to it. Uh, the San Diego Zoo stays open until 9 p.m. every night during the summer. And like, it's just so chill there. And people leave. So by the end, you just are walking around. It's like, oh, there is a sleeping tiger at the glass. And I'm the only human near here. It's it's really cool. Yeah. That's and cool. I guess when you're on your way to Australia, you have to, most of the time, you have to stop somewhere. So if you're talking about night zoos, I would absolutely stop at Singapore. The night safari is one of the best facilities 
I've been to, as well as Singapore Zoo is probably one of the best facilities I've ever been to. But the night safari is amazing. And like you said, it's so rare to come across that. And what they've done there is is so incredible. Yes, I second that. It was so good. I remember from listening to y'all's podcast, because I really do, big fan over here, um, that you both said that like Singapore Zoo might be the best zoo that you've ever seen, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I still stand by that today. Sure. Nice. Very cool. Well, moving on to another absolutely amazing zoo, though, this time in the United States. Um, zoo Atlanta, our good friends of the pod, uh, have announced uh, that their three bentlets, uh, which we have discussed on here before, are doing super well. Now, y'all who listen may remember that one of the bentlets had to be hand reared at first, but the zoo has announced that all of the siblings are now reunited with mom and nursing well. They will soon be visible on exhibit along with their mom, and once they are confident on exhibit, will be introduced to their dad as well on the exhibit. Now, dad and the bentlets have already had a few positive interactions through mesh, so it looks very promising that the entire family will be visible on exhibit before long. Uh, And also... On a personal note, uh, Zoo Atlanta did use the term bentlets. It's happening, y'all. We're making it happen. Now, um, it did seem to be a bit of a begrudging use of said word because they were like, or bentlets, if you prefer. But um, hey, I'll take it. I would take it. Run with it. I love it. (laughs) Now, I'm going to bring it back to Australia as you are joined by two Aussies. So we do need to put in a few Australian stories. Now, two endangered palmer wallabies have actually been transferred today from the Australian Reptile Park to join Aussie Ark's world-leading breeding program. Now, as per all animal moves, I guess most animals go through a pre-travel health check. And when they did that, they actually found a teeny tiny joey in the female, which is amazing. This is such cool news. And they are now fully on their way to the Barrington Tops and will be released into the wildlife sanctuary in the next month. That's so cool. Now, our friends at the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences, or VINS, have recently started a program called Colouring with Kestrels. The idea originated because Ferrisburg, is that correct? Ferrisburg, yeah. An American kestrel that lives in VINS and is no longer able to fly, um, they needed to keep a way for him to keep mentally stimulated. Um, I was obviously he can't fly, so you got to keep him active in some way. So they had the idea of having him paint in a classroom while onlookers uh, would learn about falcons. Um, and that was presented. And Ferris Burke, I really struggled You're with nailing that. it. Um, nailing was it. taken to it. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, a bird to the sky. Um, and the bird is able to paint and it's incredible and it's often the case with ambassador animals we discuss on here he's able to choose whether to participate in the painting classes Um, but so far he's he's happy to do so and he's often making noise during the part of the presentation before he comes out letting his keepers know that he's ready to come out and be the star of the show and do some painting so if you happen to get up to Vermont make sure you participate in this unique program Possibly something for you to think about with your raptors test. How cool would that be? Yeah, I did not know that raptors could paint. My mind is blown. <laughs> yeah, the team at Vins is yeah. incredible. Um, when, when, when we get you out to the States, Vermont's not like the most conducive to seeing like a lot of zoos and stuff, but um, Vins is a very special place and I think you would really like it. They do a ton of raptor rehab. Um, it kind of sounds like what you do at Lone Pine just without all of the koalas, tree kangaroos and, and other stuff, but like your bird specific stuff. Um, I, I've gotten to go through uh, and did an episode from um, their hospital and it's it's astonishing how much they can do in how like a, a small space and just it's uh, yeah, it's an, it's an amazing facility. That's so cool. All right, and then we're going to wrap up Zoo News back in Australia. And I guess this is a little far-fetched if it's relevant to the zoos, but we saw it just before we started recording and we thought we need to check <laughs> this in. Um, so you can actually check this video out on Nine News Gold Coast Instagram page. And this guy has been out in the ocean wing surfing in Mona Valley, which is in New South Wales in Australia, and he has come head to head with a humpback whale and i mean this animal breached out of the water and slammed directly on top of this guy thankfully he is completely fine and it made for some really really pretty impressive footage 
holy moly, I want to see this. I haven't seen this. I yes. want to look at that. Yes. Luckily, it's on my story. Yeah, Tess right. was off having a life uh, while Daisy and I have just been like messing around on Ooh. the internet for like two hours together. It's been a lot of fun. But... Sorry, y'all. I had dinner with me, yeah. man. Oh, that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. <laughs> All right. And that brings us to... Stereotypical animal podcast theme song. Here to bring you to conservation news. <sighs> All right. So mm. who knew that we would start conservation news by talking about a washed up rock star turned mediocre country artist. But uh, here we are. So uh, Aaron Lewis, the lead singer of the former rock band Stained, who is now a country singer playing the venues that washed up rock stars play uh, and is also a very vocal Trump supporter who regularly gigs wearing MAGA hats, has created some serious controversy with how he is promoting his new tour. And yes, I swear this is actual conservation news. Um, so <laughs> Lewis recently went hunting coyotes in texas where he killed 32 coyotes with two machine guns and then posted a photo of himself with his hunting partners his machine guns and the 32 dead coyote bodies that were laid out to spell trump 24 and that was how he chose to launch his freaking campaign to uh, get people to come to his tour now, as you can imagine, there has been a ton of backlash, even in the comments from his own fans. But of course, as the controversy got reported in the news, people who support that kind of thing came out of the woodwork and started following him. So his following has actually gone slightly up as of this recording. Um, for those that don't know, coyotes are a misunderstood species that live in families. So each dead animal not only represents all that a dead predator represents to the ecological health of the area, but also the disruption of a family of coyotes. Uh, frankly, uh, this is a sad, pathetic grasp at relevancy, and the sadder part is our country's so messed up right now over here that that it, it seems to be working. So um, I might just come live with you guys, just saying. Yeah, woof. Yeah, sometimes hearing things like that makes me question that we're actually all the same species. Yeah, I get that. I actually, I kind of almost go the opposite way with it. Um, you know, we are 99.9% .9 the same as bonobos and chimps. And if you look at what those great apes do in their culture, they they rape, they pillage, they murder, they damage each other. They they are, you know, they do not have the morality that we have. And sometimes I think, yeah, maybe maybe uh, maybe it makes sense. Maybe, maybe it makes sense that we are that related to animals that I think are amazing species, but that just do not live by a moral code like we try to. You know, it's it's, it's it makes yeah. it, it depresses the hell out of me. But then I honestly look at yeah. and it's not just you two. Like, I'm not saying this to promote you guys or the podcast, but just in all honesty, like I have other oh, that too. But I, I do have other friends in Australia and um I you know, a lot of keepers that I follow and stuff. And I'm not saying everything's perfect over there. I know it's not. We're all human. But I look at the lives that y'all live and the way that not everything seems to blow up in the same way that it does here and the way that y'all seem to take care of each other better than we do in this country. And I I just I, I don't know, you know, I just uh America's been an interesting place the last bunch of years. Uh yeah, I don't know what to say there. We're so lucky in Australia. I think we are very blessed with the lifestyle that we get to live. No, I see what you mean from an outsider's perspective too. Like I do feel like we are very blessed to live in this country and it, for the most part um, it is pretty easygoing and uh, I understand that. But, you know, as you can imagine, we have our low points too. And, um, yeah, I'll leave it at that anyway. Well, I mean, everyone <laughs> does. I just, I just feel like lately over here our low points are like super low. But – our high points are super high. I mean, every week I share the stories of amazing people, mostly in the States, doing amazing things. So there, you know, there are pros and cons. The True. cons are just so freaking loud right now. Yeah. yeah. You yeah, got to keep that hard. balance. They have hats and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> that's tough. I've, 
<laughs> I was like, mm, I don't want to get too political. But anyway, <laughs> let's um, let's go to a happier note. Um, and on a happier note, the Kenyan Wildlife Service did something amazing recently. Six hippos had sought refuge from the trials of the world, you know, as we were saying, um, by hiding out at the Naivasha sewerage site. Now, two of these hippos were calves to a third in the group. KWS was able to safely capture and transport all of the hippos to a protected area away from human-animal conflict, which is an incredible effort uh, when you think about it because transporting hippos would not be an easy feat. (laughs) No, absolutely not. That would be tough and that's an amazing story. Now, going back to our Aussie roots, an Australian legend and former Ross Safari guest, one of my favourite episodes with you, John, and someone that I actually ran into quite recently, Dr. Claire Madden, is currently asking help for taking care of sea turtles. Now, Dr. Claire Madden is the lead vet of the SeaWorld, and the SeaWorld Foundation in Australia has seen a 250% increase in sea turtles needing life-saving assistance, which is pretty, pretty confronting, if you ask me. Um, And it's not even peak rescue season here yet either. So you can visit seaworldfoundation.com.au to donate and the Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines will actually double your impact. Plus, it's going to make Claire super happy and she's great. She does an amazing job. And so dig deep. We need to help those turtles. Yes. And um, so obviously I love turtles and I love Claire. She's amazing. Um, How did you run into her recently? What's your what's your tale? Oh, I just went down to SeaWorld for the day just to hang out with more marine animals because, you know, that's what we do when we love animals. We go to other facilities. Um, and I just briefly ran into her. She's a very busy lady. Oh, I love that so much. That's so cool. It also goes to my theory that everyone in yeah. Australia knows each other. But, uh, you know. <laughs> everyone in the industry knows each other. That's, that's, sure. that's the truth everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, a new study actually shows that we have more than 8,000 amphibian species are at significantly higher risk of extinction than at the last time a major assessment of amphibians was done, which was back in 2004. Now today, two in five amphibian species are threatened with extinction. This making them amongst the most imperiled groups of animals on the planet, which is awful. Now fighting chytrid fungus and threats from humans, this isn't actually surprising. Now, also because of the amphibians absorb water and oxygen through their skin, they're even more susceptible to subtle environmental changes than other groups of animals. All right. And that brings us to... It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, right now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey! It's a segue to the park on the news. The world's oldest dog has died, living to the age, the ripe old age, I might add, of 31. Now, the dog was named Bobby and the full age was 31 years and 165 days. He lived his entire life with one family, the Costas, in a small village in Portugal. I just think that's an amazing story and I think we all wish we could have our dogs live this long. (laughs) I kind of thought Lexi was going to. Losing her recently was very hard in part because I thought she would outlive everyone and everything. I know that's not how it works, but really felt like it was going to. I know, it's wishful thinking. There's a trend going around on TikTok, I think, at the moment that's like, you know, I would give my leg to give my dog another 20 years of life, but they would trade me for a slice of chicken. <laughs> I'm like, absolutely. But the, dog's I mean, the chicken's there. really good, to be fair. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, for my dogs, it would be cheese. Absolutely. Anything for fair, cheese. Fair, fair. Um, yeah. And last but not least, in the most American story of this episode, uh, and that's an episode that features a former rock star. Anyway, um, <clears throat> you can now track uh, New York City subway rats in a new popular transit app. So the app is called Transit, and the main function is to help users figure out their bus and train travel in major cities like New York. It's an interactive app in which users add data on all kinds of conditions, which then gets analyzed so users can have real-time updates about what is going on uh, at subway stations and on bus routes to plan their trips. Uh, One bit of data that is being collected is people reporting when they see rats in these subway stations. This uh, data is being aggregated into an actual rat map so that citizens, as well as the government, 
<laughs> which is trying to reduce the rat problem in the city, uh, so much so that they literally have a rat czar now, uh, can see what is going on with the rat population at any given time. And uh, boy, if, if we had the money for it, we would definitely be queuing John Mellencamp's Ain't That America right about now. <laughs> uh, and that brings us to... Oh, animal, oh, animal. Now, in Animal Holidays, uh, we are going to still talk about October because we're still in October. Um, wait, wait, wait. But... Even even in Australia? Yeah, mate. We're not that far behind. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know how these things work. All right. Anyway, anyway, moving on. Go ahead. <laughs> um, but I would like to talk about a very important uh, month, and that is, of course, Bat Appreciation Month, month of October. Um, I love bats. I don't know if I've mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> you have, but your episode hasn't dropped yet. So. <laughs> oh, okay. True, true, true. Um, Croctober, Tamrel Month, Squirrel Awareness Month, and Adopt a Shelter Dog Month. Yeah, exactly right. And Friday the 27th, so I'm pretty sure, John, the day that this episode is yes. dropping, is World Lima Day. And we thought it'd be fun to do a bit of a collaborative social post on this. So if you haven't already, check it out. And what she means by we thought it would be fun is that Daisy was like, hey, I'm doing this. Here is mine. And Tess is already done. John, send me stuff. So, um, yeah, it it was fun, though. You were right. (laughs) No, I liked it. It's a good post. It's a good post. (laughs) Uh, I love lemurs. Lemurs are one of my favorite Oh, that's so so cool. cool. Yeah, they are amazing. Um, Yeah. And then the 28th is uh, National hug a sheep day i I don't know but it's i mean i've hugged sheep i I can see why it should be a day um the 29th is both national cat day at least here in the states and also sea slug day which i guess makes sense as i often lump cats and sea slugs together obviously (laughs) Obviously. Now that brings us into November, which is actually Manatee Awareness Month in the US. No, you guys, we talked Ooh. about manatees already a little bit, but you guys don't have manatees, but you do have dugongs. Am I saying that right? You guys probably call Dugong. them duos yeah. or something because Australia. <laughs> 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 I like that. No, we do have dugons in Australia. We actually have quite a lot of them quite close to oh, us. Nice. But I don't know about you, Tess, but I've never seen a wild dugon. Have you? <gasps> I have. What a flex. I saw one like not last week, uh, the weekend before. Yeah, they're so oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. They they seem so cool. I want to I want to see a dugong. They're really cool. Just big, chill cows of the Yeah, sea. I mean, I know they're close to manatees and I've hung out with manatees and manatees are incredible. So, yeah, that's that's awesome. <laughs> And then November 1 is Stick Insect Day, and that is all your animal holidays for the week. All right. So uh, there you have it, folks. Uh, Raw Safari Zoo News with co-hosts. Woo! Woo! Um, thank you both so much for doing this. This has been an absolute blast. Uh, even more so uh, for those that are listening, uh, as, as fun as you had listening to this, you have no idea how much stuff they made me cut that was even funnier. So uh... <laughs> hard to pronounce things your way. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you, John, so much for letting us come on and co-host of with course. you. We are stoked about this. This collaboration has been so much fun, and hopefully it's the start of a beautiful relationship going Yes, forward. and plug your podcast again. Tell people how to listen. I don't know why. I will tell you all this. Just uh, something I was going to tell you in private, but I like putting private stuff on the air sometimes. Like, it is so hard to get people i have found this and i know that like my podcast is like doing well doing very well but it still feels like i got there person by person and you know i'll do these collaborations um greensboro science center working with you guys now and stuff and we'll go for weeks and weeks and you'll see like two or three new followers a day or whatever and like it's it's so pulling teeth so i i just i cannot um stress enough that if you are listening to this and if you are a a rossifarian if you are a fan here then i really want you uh to go and check out this podcast because um it's it's really good y'all i promise i'm not just making it up i wouldn't be spending all this time waking up at five four o'clock in the morning to deal with these people um <laughs> if it wasn't so go ahead and tell them where they can find y'all 
Oh, thank you so much, John. We really appreciate you. Uh, an inspiration to both Tess and I for sure. And you can check out Trainer Talks and Tales on anywhere that you listen to your podcast. You can reach us on Instagram at Trainer Talks and Tales or on Facebook as well. And if any of you who are listening have a preference in a guest or a topic that you want to cover, just feel free to send us a DM, slide on in. And yeah, thank you so much again. Thank you, John. Yep. And of course, before I go, I want to take a moment to say thank you to uh, all of my patrons. You can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash raw safari. I'd especially like to thank my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, and brand new Red Panda level patron, Barbara Bennett. Woo! Thank you for being here, Barbara. Super excited to have a new patron. And uh, y'all, without going into the details of a private message, I have to tell you that Barbara sent me an amazing message uh, about the pod and why she's supporting. And it it meant more to me than any amount of the money from the Patreon will. I, I loved and appreciated every word of it so much. So thank you, Barbara, and welcome to the um, official, you know, Raw Safari Patreon getting to listen to bonus content world. It's very exciting. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed to this week's episode, including Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Jay Meredith, Dr. Laura Shank, Sabo, Sam Evans, Emily Rockbuck, Lisa Clare, Daisy Barrett, Tessa McKilligat, Kay Malensky, Ali Malensky, and Kristen Khalil. I appreciate you all so much. I, I was tempted to have Kay and Allie be read by our Aussie friends so that you could hear your names in an Australian accent. But um, as with all of this Australian collaboration stuff, I'm doing this at like four o'clock in the morning, my time, and I forgot. But, uh, you know, appreciate y'all being here and sending those stories my way. And last but not least, don't forget, friends, the words newsy credits backwards are Steiderk Yiswen. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. But there's, yeah, there's always rules to the exception, unfortunately. I know. We've had a that bit of... That makes no um, sense. The rules to the exception. Exception to the is rules right? is what you were going for. <laughs> wow. I was like, yeah, you can cut that bit out because that makes no sense. Now, um, November 1 is Stick Insect Day, uh, and they, those are your animal holidays for the week. Sorry. <laughs> this is why we edit. Screwed the pooch. <laughs> <laughs> Screwed the pooch, as you would say on that last one. Do you want me yeah, to redo it? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> and then November 1, wow, November has a W in it. <laughs> let's, let's start that one again. <laughs>